Encounter is brought to you by the Broome County Council of Churches, where we connect compassion with needs as we inspire growth with dignity. You'll find us in special places throughout the community. For those who remain hungry, we provide meals. For those who are challenged, we build wheelchair ramps. We comfort those who are ill, minister to those who are confined, and we remain an advocate for change and understanding on behalf of every element of our community. Connect and inspire. Encounter the Broome County Council of Churches. Good morning and welcome to Encounter. I'm your host today. My name is Joe Selipak. I'm the Executive Director at the Broome County Council of Churches. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. This is a, 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 an often repeated phrase that is done on this day. We're celebrating, of course, Easter. And I wanted to read to you the, um, the Mark version of uh, the Easter narrative. Um, of course, every gospel had its own emphasis on the uh, resurrection, its own way of approaching it, and I thought Mark was kind of applicable today. So let's listen to Mark's read, Mark's, um, read on the, um, the resurrection. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go in and anoint Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place that they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Sometimes resurrection is more than just a, um, a happy time. It can be filled with terror, it can be filled with amazement, and it can be filled with locked tombs that we don't see any way that we're going to be able to get into them. I think about this today, especially as we're in the middle of dealing with a COVID-related uh, crisis. What does it mean to celebrate the resurrection? Not so much in a major way, but in a minor way, in a, in a way in which lament is still felt and terror and amazement may be more applicable than just joy. How important is it for us to give that, that kind of perspective to, to the resurrection? How, how important is it to see, to see it as not just a time of, of joy, but also a time where we might be able to experience other feelings? Well, I think that um, we're probably going to be closer to the first Christians this Easter than many of us have ever been in our celebrations of Easter, precisely because we're in this time right now where nothing is certain and we're living in an unfamiliar world and things are happening that we don't understand and at a pace that we can't keep up with. So the bewilderment and the fear and the watching what's going on are the Holy Week feelings. Right, right. And even in the other gospels, you don't get a lot of joy in the first resurrection stories because there is so much fear because nobody had ever seen it before. Right. And I think If incarnation means anything, it means God is with us through this passion feeling and that the resurrection comes as the end, not the end of the story, but the beginning of a whole new story. So um, I think it's very important to acknowledge both, that it's a joy and it's a proclamation that Death had, is not the final answer, but it's also the recognition that one of the reasons that death, as the hymn says, has lost its sting is that God is with us every step of the way. 
My guest today is the Reverend Kimberly Chastain. She's with uh, the Binghamton United Presbyterian Church. Welcome to Encounter, Kimberly. Thank you. So uh, uh, I, I've, I've, heard this, I, I've heard this thing that, that's juxtaposition between grief and hope. So we are, we're currently grieving mm -hmm. as a culture. Can you speak a little bit about what maybe that might mean? What, how, how are we maybe even experiencing the grief of the women as they're going to the tomb trying to, trying to um, anoint the body of Jesus? Well, grief is what you experience when you've lost what's familiar. Right. And one of the important things in this time is to recognize how much of what we're experiencing, the disorientation and the fear and the, is the loss of the familiar. The most ordinary things we do have become unfamiliar because we have to think about yeah. when we go to the grocery store, are we wiping off the handles of the, of the trolleys? And are we wearing a mask or not? And how do we keep six feet away from people when we're passing each other in the aisles? The unfamiliarity of the technology that we use to keep in touch with each other, it's all disorienting. And it's sometimes I think we don't realize that we're, what we're feeling is grief, loss of the familiar. And so um, what Jesus did precisely in coming to Jerusalem during the Passover with confrontation on his mind is to disrupt and disorient familiar patterns. And even those who were prepared for that weren't prepared for the loss of the familiar the way that they experienced it. You and that that comes out in in a beautiful way, in when Jesus when Jesus uh, uh, washes the disciples' feet, for instance, yes. or when he says, "This is my body, which is given for you." This is my and taking familiar things and mm -hmm. transforming them into that's right into something very powerful that way. Yeah. And in the Gospel of John, you particularly see Jesus trying to prepare pe people the, for the idea that they're going to become the body of Christ. And that when, when the temple is torn down and the temple comes to live in the gathered Christian community, nobody knew what that meant at the time. And in a way, I think that's something we're still having to learn is that real presence doesn't just exist in the sanctuary or on the altar right. or even in the host, real presence exists with us through the power of the spirit wherever we are and whatever we're doing. Right. And that's unfamiliar because we've learned to look for Jesus in particular places at particular times. And, and it's really hard for us who are caught in, so, so for instance, we. We're, we're like looking at this through the lens of, of America, or as an American, where we want nearly instantaneous results. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult for us to live within the space of, of, of not knowing. That's right. So how do we, how do we, live, how do we live there and, and, not, and not rush to the end so quickly? Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Because uh, we, we know at the end of the story, we, we, we just want the happy, the happy end. We, we don't want to have to live within that, that, that disruption within the, the place where we feel like we've been disoriented. That's right. Right, where we're lost. Yeah, well, um, I get a lot of my theology from hymns. <laughs> and one of the hymns that's been replaying in my head is one that I learned when I was a pastor in South Central Iowa 35 years ago that I hadn't heard before and haven't heard in any church since, although I now know some people that sing it. Um, it's called, I Know Who Holds Tomorrow. Oh yeah. And you know, many things about tomorrow, I don't try to understand, but I know who holds the future and I know who holds my hand. The way you get through the liminal space is by looking 
A, at what is possible and doable in the here and now to bear witness. And sometimes bearing witness is just saying, I don't have a clue, but I'm here. Right, right. And saying, I may not know what the future holds, but I know that God will be with us, as I said to you earlier, through the end and beyond. Right. Because whatever the ending to this craziness we're in right now is, it's going to be the beginning of something else. Right. And if you believe that at the end, God is there, then you know that the beginning of something else, you're still going with God. And that, at least for me, is a great comfort and a great hope. So today, today is Easter Sunday, mm-hmm. and, and many people will be um, celebrating Easter Sunday and social distance and isolation. And in some ways, they, they may be experiencing that disruption even more so than what, yeah. than what, than what we've ever, ever had to experience in the past. Um, can, can you help us um, try to figure out theologically what does this disruption really mean, and how can we, and how can we, um, and how can we, even in spite of the fact that we're distant, distant from each other, how can we experience the resurrection, in a in a way that makes that makes sense to us? Oh, well, those are all nice, easy questions, Joe. Thank you. I, I I'm trying to I'm trying to lighten the mood, <laughs> so. <laughs> I, I well uh, to to tell you the truth, you know what, when you were talking about being in southwest south central Iowa, I was in north central Iowa, Waterloo. I was ah. I was a pastor in Hudson, Iowa. Leon and Iowa. Oh, Leon right. and Osceola. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know, in in a way, we're in a really good time for this to be going on because we do have the ability to connect virtually in so many ways, and even when we can't connect. Um, Even people who don't have computer connections can still pick up a landline and make a phone call. Right. And so the isolation is tempered by the reality that there are some connections that are possible. But I think part of it is acknowledging the grief. Part of it is acknowledging that whatever we are going to be doing, it is proximate and not what we're used to. and recognizing that we need to be gentle with ourselves and with each other. Um, I think triumphalism in Christianity does a grave disservice to those parts of the human experience that are so dark and so in need of a a word and a light. Um, And and one of the, the, you know, at our, at our congregation, we usually end both passion tellings on Palm Sunday and on Holy Thursday with a really dark organ piece. And it's beautiful and we all love it and cherish the tradition, but this year it feels like it's already dark enough. Right. And so what we have to do is remember that the light does not go out however dark it seems, and that the, if, if Jesus went down to the death, God was with Jesus and was with the disciples during this whole dark time in ways that, said, that caused them to say, this is revelatory about who God is and how God acts in history, that mm-hmm. God is in the community in its fear and its terror and God brings out of the community in its fear and its terror something new and something transformative. Yeah. Do I know what that looks like yet? No. Only only in a glass darkly. Well, I mean that's that's the whole point is that you can't at this moment soothsaying. That's right. And other kinds of things become part of the like the so, so what we've de- what we tend to do is we and I, I sorry about touching my face, my nose itches, and I have to do it. Um, as long as you don't then shake hands with me, no, I think I, I'm okay. I, I, I don't think I will. We'll, we'll touch. <laughs> we may touch elbows if you like, but but the you know the real the real the real issue the real issue 
in a lot of ways, when I think about this whole thing about light and darkness and, and certainty and uncertainty and the juxtaposition between all these various things is that, you know, we're, we're always, we always want to go to the certainty. We always want to go to, we always want to go to full on light instead of just viewing a little tiny little candle as being enough light. Um, enough light for right now. You know, it, it's, it's, it's more than, it's more than it, it, living in the moment, especially right now is really, really hard because we, we only get these tiny little glimmers okay. of, of hope. Um, and we're all looking, we're all, and it's one of the reasons why I think Governor Cuomo's, um, Governor Cuomo's press conferences have become so popular is because he, he projects, he projects leadership in the midst of an uncertainty. He, he, and I, and I, and I don't care, you know, right. if, if people like really, really. But the calm and the decisiveness and the clarity. And, and the clarity. I want to lift up the truth. Right. He's giving us the truth as best he knows it. And even if it's really <clears throat> painful. And you know, we say the truth will set you free. And the subtext is, but first it will make you mad. <laughs> <laughs> In a world where it's hard to know what to believe, having somebody just clearly lay out information is so calming. Right. Because there's a lot of sound and fury everywhere. And as when things get louder and louder, to have someone just saying, this is, this is what we know now, and this is what we expect, and this is what we are doing, like it or not like it, it makes you feel like, okay, somebody has a grip. And even if it's not a grip on everything, it's a grip on something. Right. My guest today is uh, the Reverend Kimberly Chastain from Binghamton United Presbyterian Church. We've been talking about the resurrection and about disruption and about Easter in a, in a, general, in a general sense. Now, for, for people at your, in your congregation, how are, they, how are you going to be celebrating Easter with them this year? Um, we had already started streaming worship about a year ago um, using Facebook Live, and now we've added a Zoom component so we can have some sharing of joys and concerns and some what we call a virtual coffee hour afterwards. Um, and so far, we have been able to um, pre record some things, and we have been able to um, put together what we hope will be a much lower key and smaller celebration. We have it set up so that people can call on the telephone if they can't get on through the computer. And we are, we hope, creating the expectation that it won't be the biggest or the best and we won't set a new standard for perf perfection, but we will be telling the story. We will be sharing together in this experience and we will be offering to each other as much presence as is possible. One of the big debates in, I think, most denominations, but especially in the PCUSA recently, has been about can you celebrate the Lord's Supper <laughs> virtually? <laughs> and in the Presbyterian understanding, Christ is really present in and through the gathered community. Right. Well, if the community is not gathered, what does that mean? And if you start with the question, does the Book of Order, our, our <laughs> Constitution, allow this? Right. The answer is no. But if you start with the question, what is necessary for this time, which is the right question, then virtual communion becomes something that you can do. Right. Because the Book of Order wasn't written at a time when the only possible gathering was a virtual gathering. We have to recognize that this is something that the book didn't 
anticipate, <laughs> and yeah. we have to find a way to, to, to make it matter in the present day. Otherwise, we've fallen into false legalism, and that's the opposite of resurrection. Right, and so you need to, even, even in the midst of your, your, the way that we're celebrating worship right now, there's a disruption. That's right. So we're experiencing, in a way, what they did on, on, on Good Friday and, and Holy Saturday, and when they're, they're trying to figure out what the future is going to look like. Well, and even on Easter Sunday, nobody knew what the future was going to look like. Okay, <laughs> you read in Mark about yeah. the empty tomb and not telling anybody because they didn't know what it meant. Right. In Matthew, we've got the authorities looking to find out who stole the body. Right, exactly. And nobody knew if, G okay, we saw Jesus now. Are we going to see Jesus again? <laughs> Is, or, or and Luke, Jesus he just has, keeps popping up all right. over the place, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we're promised the gift of the Holy Spirit, but we don't know what that means. Right, right, right. And so how do we make sense of all of what's coming at us? That's exactly what the church tries to eliminate as much as possible in 21st century life and what we have to find a way to embrace this year and recognize that the witness of the early church and the witness right now is that that's the way it has always been. Right, right. And maybe if you know too much about what's going to happen on Easter Sunday, you have missed the point. Well, yeah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so the, 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 issue of, of, the issue of Easter Sunday is not certainty. That's right. So Because certainty has a way of, of, of running us into hubris and pride. So even then, you're dealing with the issue of mystery, of, of um, lack of lack of understanding at okay. some some points. I have said my entire ministry that I believe that the question is not did the resurrection happen, but does the resurrection happen? Right. So if you're looking for Easter, if you're looking for the promise, don't look at churches that are shuttered because of the pandemic. Look at the way people are going about making new things happen in this time and right. are connecting to each other and are building possibilities that may lead us to new life once we are able to be, you know, I don't think normal the way it was is what we're going back to and I don't think it should be what we're going no. back to. I think we have to now build a new world and a new commonwealth that reflects the commonwealth of God. Right. And I think that, again, is so similar to what the first believers, they didn't call themselves Christian yet, were going through. And, the, and that's really the, that's really been the cause, you know, so, so whenever there's been a pandemic or other kinds of things that have happened, there's always a choice that's being made. Do we go back to, do we wanna go back to Egypt? Mm -hmm. so to speak exactly you know or do we or do we want to kind of figure out what this promised land looks like and try to figure out how to live here yeah. in this new reality because what really i mean what we're dealing with as far as the covid virus is concerned is something new but it's going to be something more prevalent as we as we go into the future so we're going to this isn't going to be the last the last virus it's kind of like the 500 year flood that hit right and then five years later we got a we got another 500 year flood right so we're we're dealing with a new reality um within the within this world and and then how do we how do we then begin to shape and mold this in a way that it better reflects what we view as being the nature of the kingdom of god and it seems to me as if that's that's been the job of the church all along has been to try to figure out, well, now that the printing press has come, how do we then begin to reflect those values? And um, do, we, do we print it in German? Do we print it in Latin? Do we print it, you know, 
the, it, all of a sudden, be, all these things become possible because of the new, the new world that we're living in. I learned something about a month ago that I didn't know before. The first American Bible that was printed, in order to make it cost effective, they could only print a certain amount. And the reason that the apocryphal, what, what are in Protestantism <laughs> called the I apocryphal books, were left out was that to add them would have expanded the Budget. costs of printing to the point <laughs> that it wasn't affordable anymore, right, right. so they just took them out. And it isn't that anybody thought that those books weren't important anymore, the intertestamental books, except they, because they weren't in the American printings of the Bible, they were off the radar. Right. You never know what's going to change ordinary religious and faith practice. And sometimes it's not even something you notice ahead of time. But if you're paying attention not to, uh, individual, to individual events, but to the arc of history, you begin to see that the choices are always love and fear. Yeah. And the message, I believe, of Christianity is that the response of faith, even in uncertainty, even in dark times, even when it's a struggle, is that ch the choice is always to choose love. Yeah. And in a time of fear and a time of struggle, choosing love becomes more difficult and sometimes the choices aren't as clear. But the witness is that we try to be faithful in that choice today, tomorrow, through Holy Week, and after Easter when we talk about what resurrection looks like. And love is a great place for us to be able to end this, this, this uh, conversation on Easter and what it means for the church. Thanks for being on, on Encounter, Kimberly. Thanks for having me. And thank you for all of you who are watching us today on this Easter. Remember, Christ is risen risen indeed and he is risen indeed amen amen